and there we have ah welcome to wood turning with dick by the way this is going to be a fusion goblet as you guessed from the title just now i've got a nice piece of tight grained wenge or wenge don't know how you want to pronounce it personally i prefer wenge but i i'm told wenge is the correct way of saying it Eh, whatever this is going to be the top of my goblet this is going to be the base well somewhere here probably a little bit of scrap at the bottom nice thin stem up and some captive rings as many as i can i think odd numbers three or five similar size same size if i can and just going to talk you through the steps and the processes i've made several of these over the years not done one for a little while so bear with but got a nice bit of beach nothing special nice bit of um wenge and first things first let's make that round and put a little chuck grip in this end to then be able to put that in my chuck and that is very rough down just use the bowl gouge as you saw a bit rough around the edges but it really doesn't matter it's roughing down there's some, imp there's some imperfections here but they will come out as i turn down when i glued these two bits of wood together there was nothing on this this inner side so from coming down to a very narrow stem in theory won't be an issue shouldn't see any of this there shouldn't be any sort of weakness there either uh, next job is to shape the goblet itself the actual drinking vessel not that I'm, anyone's going to be drinking out of this i have an idea in my head of what shape to make the glass and that's just like an elegant wine glass elongated fat slightly narrow at the top here slightly fatter here and all very gradual curves let's judge roughly where i think the goblet is going to sit within there shape wise i like that a little bit more finishing to do there i'll get the rest of the sandpaper make that perfectly round this bit of the neck as it peters down onto the stem, that will come a lot later. Before I do anything further, let's put this end in a chuck. That's just gonna give me a, a more secure grip for now. You'll see why later. This is originally 14 inches long. It's gonna end up the whole piece is slightly smaller than 14 inches, obviously, because the bit's coming off here, bit's coming off here. The foot, I don't wanna mess with the size. That needs to be the same as the top there for stability. The stem is going to be very long with as many captive rings as I can get in there. What I don't want to do is have captive rings that are the same size as this and this. So I'm going to take this down to a desired outer diameter ring size, which is only going to be taken down by half inch or so. So let me just do that quickly. I'm thinking rings that big are possibly even slightly smaller than that. Before I worry about that anymore, I've got to hollow the cup out in a moment. Before I do that, I'm going to finish this to a fairly high finish and I'll come back to you in just a moment. Those of you that use a lathe steady will know exactly what I'm doing now. And if you haven't got one, if you want to do projects like this, expand your ideas, expand your experience, get yourself a lathe steady. Buy one. It's not that expensive an accessory. If it's a basic little one, make it yourself or get someone to make it. So worth it. Well, that was end grain turning, which was actually far more challenging than I thought. But I did it. I got there and I got a reasonable depth as well, leaving a little bit of meat on the bottom for strength. Courtesy of the neighbour's dog, kindly gave me this the other day through the fence. And I was like, oh, I need that. I need one of those for this project. So thank you, neighbour's dog. He did have plenty more. It's not like I was stealing his only ball, you know, it's only fair. Project, woodworking. I don't want to pierce the ball. But I do want enough on there to hold it nice and, nice and tight. Good, now I can take my lathe steady off. All right, here comes the fun bit, the captive rings. My cup's that big. Still think that needs to come down a little bit more before I start creating the captive rings. So, kind of quickly skim that off just a little bit deeper. That'll look quite nice with the transition of the two woods. And then they, wherever they end up or land, might look pretty cool. 
There you go, that's a bit better. Now, for your captive rings, you need to leave enough room to work the skew chisel around the ring on each piece. Now, that will depend on the size of your, of your skew chisel you're using. So I'm gonna separate them using the parting tool by a fair whack. I want, uh, really ideally, with a, with a stem this length, I want five. I think five will be cool. Not too many. It's all looking very rough at the moment, obviously. This bit up here, I've left for the time being, just in case I break one of my rings and I want to turn another one out of that section there. So that will stay for the minute. Next thing is parting tool, clean all these up, get them all nice and even before I then start shaping. Leaving the middle of each ring the same width, because I don't what I don't want to do is have lots of different size rings. I don't think it looks very cool. Now, in order to make that round and get that skew chisel in there as deep as I can, I'm going to have to come a little bit deeper on the stem to allow me to get room to get my skew chisel in there, because I do want these rings round. Before I go too deep on those sides, I'm going to sand as much of it as I can to get as round as possible and do a little bit of shaping with the skew chisel. Alright, looking good. I'm liking the uniformity in size. I just basically measured with my fingers there. This one's a little bit fatter. I'll trim that down with the sandpaper. So I'm going to quickly sand those, getting the sandpaper in and round and getting this as round as possible. And eventually, I'm going to part this off with a small parting tool. There you go. All sanded to approximately the same width and size. A little bit of sand of sealer. Comes up lovely on that beach. I love those lines in there. I'll sand these back in a minute and put some wax on. And I'll come back to you when we're parting them off. And can you believe it? I didn't have the camera on for the final party. I am so sorry. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, to me, not. Because um, I'm sure you wanted to see that. Simply, I used the parting tool like this and came in at a, you can see here, a fairly steep angle. Uh, both sides, a little bit at a time until finally they all came off. And now it's just floating around like this. So apologies for that. Now I'm going to shove those up one end, smooth that off a little bit. I might as well take this down at the same time because I don't need an extra ring because they all came off successfully. Yay! Don't worry about this. I'll aim for a better tool finish a little bit later on. That's a little bit not very good tool finish, obviously. First things first, I'm going to find a bit of Abronet that's still got a bit of life to it and some sticky tape, um, duct tape on this occasion. Don't ask why I've got duct tape. Put that the right way round. If it's the wrong way round, it'll just unroll on you. And that's 240 grit finished. And I can take that off now. Lovely. Now I'm developing a little bit of a lip here. The next step is to take this down to the actual width that I want it before sanding. Obviously I want to keep those at one end while I do the other end. I don't want them bouncing on my chisel because that would take a chunk out potentially. What I'm going to do is get a bit of tape on the end ring, lightly pressed against the ring. Just going to hang that on there. That will stop the others riding up and that one. Watch this. Ta-da! I know I should be using a skew chisel for this, but the Wenge is not the best with the skew chisel, or my, my approach to it isn't. So I'm making very slow progress with my very small bowl gouge running along the stem here. The sandpaper will get the rest of it. I know I'm not the world's best turner when it comes to actual chisel work, but, you know, the approach is there, the thought is there, and the design is certainly there. Well, I hope so anyway. Most people think, seem to think so. <laughs> Yay! I've opened up that gap there so I can get a bit of sandpaper in and just clean up the, the edge of the bottom, not the dead middle. I can do that by hand later. 
Wait for that plane to go overhead. Taking that central bit down to about an inch. And I can part that off later, carefully, once I've finished all the sanding. I put a very slight angle on that, you saw as I was coming in, so that when it does sit on its base, it's going to be sitting on this outside lip, not on the middle of it and wobbling. <laughs> Back over here, I've got some sanding to do. Take this off. I'm going to let these run free. And move my rest out of the way. Now I should be able to get a bit more of a twist on this and get rid of some of this edge if I'm just work at it gently and then the rest I think I'll have to do by hand. With, I might do that with the 400 and the 600 by hand. That's the 400 grit done on the inside. I am still left with that lip albeit a very gentle one. So I'm going to take my piece of 400 and I'm manually going to sand that ridge off to make them nice round rings. Once I've done that, sanding all of this, they are all sanded, looking lovely. That wing, wenge, wenge, I'm going to say both just to uh, upset anybody, um, but yeah, that's looking quite nice. So. A bit of Santa Sealer. Well, I guess I can finish Santa Sealering these, denib it, wax it up, and some nice pretty pictures at the end. Of course, not forgetting the parting off. You want to see that. Who doesn't? Everything's waxed. It's ready to go. Ready to take off. Finish the bottom, sand the bottom, put my maker's mark on there, and photograph. And you know what I need to do? I need to sand the bottom. So I may as well do that quickly. Back with you in just a sec. And we have release. Just a little bit of tidy up to do on that and pictures to follow.